The Anglo-Boer War has sometimes been called the Last Gentleman's War. Yet, when the smoke cleared from the battlefields, from the burnt-out farms and kraals, and all the soldiers had gone home, the death toll revealed a different reality. Almost twice as many women and children had died in the war than the number of soldiers killed on the battlefield. Black and white mothers, and especially their children, perished in large numbers in concentration camps established by the British Army. During the so-called guerrilla phase of the war, the Boers in the Felt had the support of their families, who were still living on farms throughout the Transvaal and Free State Republics. These family members provided them with food, medical care, information on troop movements, etc. To prevent this, the British Army began to implement its so-called scorched earth tactics. This led to the systematic destruction of about 30,000 Boer farmhouses, which were either burnt down or demolished by using explosives. Apart from destroying crops and food stockpiles on farms, livestock were also killed. In addition, Boer women and children were forcefully removed from farms and confined to concentration or internment camps. The idea was to bring the war to an end by preventing any support to the Boers in the felt. Poor conditions in these white camps resulted in an outbreak of disease, causing a humanitarian disaster. At the same time, the houses and livestock of small-scale black subsistence farmers, especially in the Free State, were likewise destroyed. Compared to the almost 145,000 Boer women and children confined to concentration camps, a total of about 140,000 black civilians and farm workers suffered the same fate. However, there was a difference. Especially in the Transvaal, black inhabitants were simply deposited at certain points along the railway line and left to fend for themselves. These people received no food, medical care or shelter at all and had to establish their own temporary rudimentary camps near those of the white camps. Many young black adults in these camps had no option but to obtain employment with the British Army in order to survive. But there was no refuge for the elderly, women and children. While the conditions in the 49 white permanent camps were dire, the situation in the 66 temporary or transit black camps was far worse. Low-grade housing, almost no medical care and insufficient food supplies were part of the harsh realities they had to face every day. The same epidemics experienced in white camps also swept through the black camps. Deliberate neglect by the British in especially the black camps caused famine and slow starvation in some instances, with the highest death rate being in the last quarter of 1901. It is estimated that about 24,000 black civilians perished in these camps between 1901 and 1903. The fatalities in white concentration camps were almost 28,000. Emily Hobhouse, a British citizen, came to South Africa to expose to the world media the appalling conditions in the white camps. 
thus contributing significantly towards improving conditions and saving lives. Shortly after the war, M.T. Stain, former president of the Orange Free State Republic, initiated a process to honour the Boer women and children who suffered and died during the war. The National Women's Memorial, with a statue of a woman with a dying child on her lap as focal point, was unveiled during a well-attended commemorative event in 1913. This monument embodies the words of Emily Hobhaus, when she, in remembrance of her experiences with the Boer women and children in the concentration camps, wrote the following. For women folk, war is a hard time. The excitement and the glory so alluring to men do not fall to their share. Only mental agony and the slow days of suffering. And it falls hardest on the children. Initially, Hobhouse, in recognition of her contribution to improve the conditions in the camps and uplift the poor Afrikaner community after the war, was invited to do the unveiling of the statue. She accepted the invitation and departed by ship from Europe to Cape Town. Halfway en route to Bloemfontein, ill health unfortunately forced her to turn back and she could not attend the unveiling ceremony. Instead, a speech of hers was read to the audience as part of the official proceedings before the unveiling of the statue that was now conducted by President Stain's wife. Afrikaners held Hobhouse in such high acclaim that after her death in 1926, her ashes were brought to South Africa and buried at the foot of the Women's Memorial. However, it is not widely known today that the same political leaders who bestowed this honour upon Hobhouse also did her a great injustice. When her speech was read to the audience during the unveiling ceremony, a part was deliberately omitted. One of these sentences read, Does justice not bid us remember today how many thousands of black people perished also in the concentration camps in a quarrel that was not theirs? This act of omission was indicative of a mindset in which the involvement of black South Africans in the war had to be underplayed. Unfortunately, this mindset prevailed for almost a hundred years after the unveiling of the Women's Memorial. Furthermore, this omission nurtured the unfair view amongst many historians that Hobhouse only focused on suffering in white camps, while she was indifferent to suffering in black camps. However, at the dawn of the new democratic dispensation in South Africa, with its emphasis on reconciliation, and as a result of new insights and perspective provided by research and scholarship, the management of the War Museum of the Boer Republics decided to strategically reposition the museum to allow for a more inclusive approach. Against this background, it became the museum's vision to be an institution of excellence, whereby the inclusivity and suffering of all communities during the Anglo-Boer War is depicted, thus propagating the message that negotiation is preferable to war. The aim is not to minimize the experiences of the Afrikaner community during the war, but to expand the scope of this national museum to include the suffering of all South Africans during the war. Since then, the museum has been working relentlessly to rectify the injustices of the past by also giving recognition to the role and suffering of black South Africans in the war, an issue Hobhouse attempted to raise in her speech, a plea ignored for almost a century. Several initiatives in this regard were launched by the museum, starting with the establishment of the Sol Plyke Hall inside the museum. Furthermore, a memorial commemorating the establishment of the first white, as well as black concentration or internment camps more than 110 years ago, was erected on the grounds of the museum. Several substantial publications of the museum likewise emphasize the involvement of black South Africans in the war. During the museum's Women's Day celebrations on the 9th of August 2013, white and black women representing three generations jointly laid wreaths at the foot of the Women's Memorial, a first in the hundred-year history of the monument. In a sense, this was a symbolic gesture correcting the injustice not only done to black South Africans in the war, but to a lesser extent also to Emily Hobhouse.
Thus far, the museum has done much to revisit and commemorate the role and suffering of black women and children in the Anglo-Boer War. But what about men? Black people living in locations outside towns did not suffer extensively during the war. On the other hand, black farm workers bore the brunt of the war. About 12,000 farm workers were involved in the hostilities by the Boers. The duties of these so-called Achterreers were to look after horses and livestock, cook food, drive wagons, lead oxen, and perform general duties in and around the camp. Just like the rank-and-file Boers on commando, Achterreers were not paid for their services. They frequently came under British artillery fire, and several of them were killed while serving with the Boer commandos. Only on a few occasions were these Achterreers armed by the Boers to actively take part in military encounters. A limited number of sand people, due to their excellent knowledge of the countryside and tracking abilities, were used with great success as scouts by the Boer forces. Some Achterreers were likewise used as spies by the Boer forces to gain intelligence on the troop movements of enemy units, their numbers, as well as the nature of their weaponry and logistical support. When caught, these spies were executed on the spot by the British Army. By the end of the war, only a small number of loyal Achterreers were still serving with the Boer commandos. One of the best-known Achterreers was Jan Reiter, the president of the Free State's groom and cook. On one occasion in 1901, he saved President Steyn from certain capture near Reitz. Reiter was eventually buried at Onserist, the Steyn family farm just outside Bloemfontein. During the war, approximately 32,000 Boers were captured by the British. 23,000 of them were shipped off to overseas prisoner of war camps in India and Ceylon, as well as on the islands of St. Helena and Bermuda. When captured, Achterreers were transported to coastal cities in South Africa and also sent to overseas prisoner of war camps. In later years, a few distant voices amongst the Afrikaner community were heard, propagating the idea that the contribution of Achterreers during the war should be acknowledged. Unfortunately, these pleas were greeted by deafening silence due to both apathy and the political mindset of the day. This idea, however, had been rekindled during the strategic repositioning of the museum. As a result, the making of the Achterreya Memorial was commissioned. Apart from recognizing the role of black men in the war, the unveiling of the Achterreya statue in the same year that the unveiling of the Women's Memorial is being commemorated is of special significance to the museum. The erection of this statue of the Achterreya was long overdue. The museum wants to honor the role of the Achterreya in this way. To us, it symbolizes the completion of a hundred year cycle the last piece in a puzzle that will now finally depict the bigger picture.